from New York City for our viewers worldwide. I'm Shanali Basak, and Bloomberg Real Yield starts right now. Coming up, markets dial back Fed cut expectations, making March a toss-up. And big-time investors are starting to make calls on a steeper yield curve. And long-term yields are still on the rise. But we begin with the big issue. Rate cut optimism is fading. The market might be a little bit ahead of itself. The markets are being a little exuberant. The markets have now priced in what I think is probably excessive interest rate cuts in the U.S. The market is now calling for a 175 basis point cut by the Fed. Really? How about this? No way. The six rate cuts, that's a pipe dream. Our core team has four cuts and four cuts, 24 and 25. The big picture, though, is they're going to start lowering at some point. We still see rate cuts. I have no doubt that we'll get to rate cuts at some point. They're going to have to start cutting because they have the space to cut and the economy can keep growing. I think it's important to be cautious. They're going to be prudent. They're going to be thoughtful. If they get it wrong, they're going to get it wrong by staying higher for longer. It's going to be a bumpy year. I want to bring you to a function on the Bloomberg terminal that I've been using a lot lately and a lot of traders have been using a lot lately. That is the WIRP function. This is the probability of rate cuts that you might see through the end of the year according to a Fed swaps. Now, take a look. This March expectation has fallen to 40 percent, less than a flip of a coin. This just earlier in this week was much higher than that, with many traders still expecting a March rate cut. And not only that, you did have the expectation of more than six rate cuts into the end of this year. That probability has dropped, or the number of rate cuts rather expected by the market, has dropped to 5.3 nearly. Let's see how this keeps changing as more economic data comes in. But I want to flip up the board here and show you what the rapid repricing of expectations has meant for the two-year yield in particular. Look back past 5%, if you can remember it, back in October. Just the rapid decline we have seen in the two-year yield. We have seen us drop fairly meaningfully by more than 80 basis points from peak to trough to where we are today. But when you look at the most recent repricing, we have taken a small bump higher by more than 20 basis points. We are now standing at about 440, 441 to end the week. Now joining us now is Krishna Mamani of Lafayette College and uh, J.P. Morgan's Kelsey Barrow. Krishna, just starting with you here, when you look at this is rapid repricing that we're seeing in the market. How much more repricing do we have to go? Well, so I, I think given the strength of the data, we may have a little bit more to go on the March cut. Having said that, I think the key point to remember here is markets tend to overthink this. That is, if, if you look at the inflation data and the growth data, growth is stable uh, and uh, perhaps slowing a tad uh, in, in, in my judgment, but that, that remains up for discussion. But more importantly, inflation is coming down. And that, that's a very well-established trend. So the Fed is going to cut, uh, whether it cuts in March or May, if, unless you are a short-term interest rate trader, it doesn't really matter that much. Uh, more importantly, I think those rate cuts are going to be more than three or four, or at least more than three, uh, even if they are not six. So the point is, don't overthink this. Uh, you know, the Fed is going to cut rates, and that's probably going to be good for the markets uh, uh, for if you have a 12-month investment horizon, even if it isn't that hot in the first half of the year. Kelsey, when does the Fed start cutting and how many times this year? Right, so that is obviously the debate, and I think March was too soon. So you are seeing the market start to price out that probability. But I don't think that the market is going to uh, move all the way to the Fed. So I do think that the, the market is continue, going to continue to expect more rate cuts than what the market is priced in. So for us, we're looking at May or June as more likely for the first rate cut. It's going to be driven by the improvement and in inflation. And I will say what you're hearing less talk about is these uh, this probability of a 50 or 75 basis point rate cut. Waller really was walked that back. I think he was strong in walking that back, communicating that things are going to be gradual. You're not going to be looking at 50 or 75 basis point rate cuts unless one, there's an external shock to growth or two, there's some real deceleration in the labor market. And so far, I mean, what we saw with initial jobless claims this week, Week, I mean, the labor market is still rock solid. How much risk is there, Krishna, that you do start to see a material uh, fall off in the economic data, particularly labor? 
Well, so I, I think the risk is re relatively modest. What is more interesting is the market's expectations for that risk. Uh, and I think if you kind of look around things uh, and you look at the various commentators, the conclusion and, and positioning as well, the conclusion has to be that we are expecting a, a, a kind of a gradual deceleration in inflation, uh, growth remaining reasonably robust, and rates remaining very well behaved. And, and that in, in that scenario, the pain trade really is, uh, doesn't mean it's going to come about, but the thing that the markets are most ill-positioned for is really 10-year rates at 3%. I, I, I mean, I chuckle when I say that, but the point I'm trying to make is that is one scenario that is not priced in the market, and we should pay a little bit more attention to that potential scenario than we are doing at the moment. Okay, 3% 10 year. We were standing at 415 today. Kelsey, Indeed. what brings the 10 year down to 3% and how fast? Well, obviously, you'd need to see a material shift in the economic outlook, both inflation coming down, but also I think you need to see that pickup in layoffs and that increase in unemployment that gets the Fed moving faster. But um, I think Krishna brings up a really good point, which is we think the risk reward in the fixed income market is really attractive right now for that reason. So right now we don't expect a recession near term, but you get to collect the carry as you hold your fixed income because yields are much higher than they've been in the past. And you get that protection, that capital appreciation. If we do fall into that scenario that markets aren't priced for, your core high quality fixed income could return uh, let's say high single digits in a scenario like Krishna is describing, which the market is not prepared for. Well, Krishna, how far out on duration do you go if you have an expectation of the 10 year hitting that point at any time soon? Well, so again, I don't have an expectation of the, the uh, 10 year being at 3% in the first half of this year, but I think the markets are so ill positioned for that that they are going to react far more violently than what we are expecting. So, and in that scenario, I think 10, and, and to balance out the risk in case things don't work out that way, I think 10 year is an ideal part of the, uh, of the yield curve to position for that sort of a uh, potential outcome. Well, it's interesting, Kelsey, because you we on this program, we've had a lot of investors sitting pitching duration, pitching the 10 year as we've been talking about. But as of late, it's been a pretty painful trade in the last couple of weeks. How much pain are investors feeling right now and putting new money to work, particularly in duration? I think that any backup you get in yields is a buying opportunity. And there were a lot of people at the end of last year, our clients included, that were worried that they missed the opportunity to get into the fixed income markets. You saw the US ag and the global ag in the last two months of the year returned eight and nine percent. Those are massive numbers. And so I don't think it's really surprising to see somewhat of a pullback, some indigestion this year. But when I look at the markets so far this year, and I'll take investment grade credit as a really good example. The supply that's being issued is being taken down so well. We are seeing demand coming from all corners of, of, of our universe looking to get invested in fixed income now. And you're seeing it in, for instance, regional banks, which were a place that no one wanted to touch last year. Those bonds are being issued by regional banks today. No concession three, five, seven times oversubscribed. So the tone has really shifted, and I think that people are, are still looking to get in, and these backups are actually an opportunity for them. So, Krishna, to, to really harp on this a little more as well, uh, the idea of buying opportunities at this moment, what do you think are some of the most mispriced opportunities in the Treasury market? When I think about the long end, I wonder what some of the ramifications are of things that are not about rate cuts, things like quantitative tightening. Well, so it, it, I, I think for fixed income investors, that is really the biggest challenge. That is, uh, the, the markets are priced uh, 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 quite uh, quite nicely in, in the in the for for the outcome of a soft landing. So the, the, there aren't really too many mispricing. So if you're going to take a punt, you'll have to take a punt with a particular particular viewpoint. To come back to Kelsey's point that she was making uh, making earlier. I think if the inflationary trends remain uh, remain the way they are, the upside in yield, you know, we have certainly gone up from four to four twenty, but the meaningful upside in 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 rates is is pretty limited in my judgment. 
On the other hand, if there is any bit of softening, given the positioning, the downside is going to be massive because we are ill-positioned for that. So I, I think the, the, her point was an extraordinarily good one. That is, the, the risk-reward is pretty, um, pretty convex at this point uh, for, for a rally in rates than it is for a backup in rates, however painful that trade may seem like today. What about the non-rate cut elements of the story here? We mentioned quantitative uh, tightening here, but what about also, you know, you think about bank balance sheets, you think about issuance, treasury issuance coming up. What are the hiccups we could see along the way, Kelsey? Well, I think quantitative tightening uh, is probably coming to a conclusion at some point this year. I don't think it's going to happen immediately, but this is actually uh, something that we've heard a lot more from the Fed recently. And uh, it seems that their view is that tapering is actually uh, closer than it is uh, than many people appreciated it is. So I think um, with the quantitative tightening side, it's going to help uh, demand on the margin. So things like uh, liquidity between on the run and off the run treasuries, things like swap spreads and then also um, you know for banks if deposit growth is no longer shrinking eventually they'll start to rebuild their hold to maturity books and so that could be good for things like agency mortgages and treasuries so I actually think the QT story on the margin is is a, a net positive uh, for 2024 because it should start to be tapered out uh, over the course of the year. Kelsey Krishna we have to leave it there that is Krishna Mamani and Kelsey Barrow we thank you for your time. We also want to mention the S&P 500. It's risen to a new intraday record high, if you can believe it. It was a moment that we were waiting for all through the end of last year. It is January 19th, almost 20 days into the first day of the of month of the year. And we are back standing at the top. Now, up next, we're going to talk about the auction block. Bank of America, JP Morgan, and other big banks drive record sales or near record sales. We'll talk about that next. This is Real Yield on Bloomberg. I'm Shanali Basak, and this is Bloomberg Real Guild. And it's time now for the auction block, where we are seeing issuance at a blistering pace. Debt sales were led by the big Wall Street banks, JP Morgan, Wells Fargo, Morgan Stanley, and Bank of America, all with offerings this week. And it wasn't just the big names. We had regional banks joining the rush. PNC, U.S. Bank Corp, citizens with over $7 billion of combined investment grade sales. And with all of this action and still almost two weeks left to go, this month is already the second busiest January on record. The bankers have been busy. There have been nearly 100 150 billion dollars in sales. And speaking of credit, Double Line's Jeff Sherman lays out his playbook. You want to be in the middle of the stack in terms of credit quality. Being good enough right now in this market with credit is the place to be. Spreads are relatively tight on these levels as we had the everything rally over the last 12 weeks. And so I don't think it's time to be a hero and be delving down in the risk spectrum. If anything, use this as a way to trim some of those exposures and try to migrate up a little bit in that quality. We're going to bring in Oak Tree's David Rosenberg to talk about this credit landscape. David, if you think about, you know, the time when Oak Tree was just a tiny little asset manager once upon a time, you now have $10 billion in the global credit strategy alone. How do you start to put that to work in this environment? You know, there, there's a lot to do. And so it's been, it's been a fun time. But I think the reality is when, when you look at fixed income, you know, I always find it funny. It's in the name, fixed income. It's about the income. But yet for years, no one's been talking about the income because, frankly, it wasn't very high. Now we're in a period where getting high single digits, low double digit yields is not very difficult to do. And especially when you have a multi-strategy platform where you have lots of different asset categories to look to, there's, there's plenty to buy. Well, I think a lot of investors are looking around the world right now and saying, how much risk do you take on? Yeah. A lot of questions about whether we're in a soft landing and how much risk is that the soft landing turns into a harder landing. What do you think of risk? You know, I think there was this massive risk rally at the end of last year. I think everybody got really excited about convexity. That was the big term of, of the year, which I always say is just a fancy word for upside. And so everyone's looking for, for things with discount. And so the riskier things found a bid. I tend to be, you know, I tend to be a conservative guy. I'm a, I'm a bond investor at heart, and so I like to say professional pessimist. But, you know, right now, I think when you look at the market, the market's kind of pricing in this amazing scenario. We're going to have a soft or no landing. They have at least five rate, rate drops in, in spite of the fact of a soft or no landing. And it sounds, sounds great. 
but it's got to the point to me where it's like the market is pricing in this amazing scenario, and if it just turns out to be pretty good, there's going to be some, some repricing of risk. And so for me, I think it's being cautious is more prudent right now. What does it mean to be prudent in this environment? Because you think about last year and yeah. the default rates we saw, the bankruptcies rising yes. to pretty significant levels, but this year, jury's out <laughs> on how fast right. that, that could turn. Do you think this year is better or worse than last year? I think this year will be a little bit better, you know, as far as the, the defaults. When you think about the default rate, one of the things we had in our market, usually you have the recession as the cleansing event, but we had COVID. So we had a cleansing event before the recession. So all the really weak companies defaulted during COVID and kind of cleansed out the market. And if you think about it, if COVID hadn't happened, those companies would have stumbled along for, you know, till the next recession and then defaulted. But you had in bonds a 5% default rate and loans near a 4% default rate. So you pulled forward a lot of that, a lot of that impact. And so I think there's going to be less of a default impact in 2024. You know, you think about what Oak Tree has done on the private side, you know, record breaking fundraising yeah. and a lot of fund managers now have raised a lot of money. How much competition is there to put assets to work in this environment? I think you know, when you think about it quite simply, you have a market, especially on the private side, went from over the past couple of years from roughly 300 billion to over a trillion. It's really quite amazing. And Howard Marks always reminds me, when you have a market that grows that quickly, eventually you buy what you can, not what you want to. And so you have to be really careful. And so I think that when it comes to competition, to me, it really comes down to the ability to pick credits. I think, cre I think we very much found ourselves in a credit picker's market. And I always tell people, I'm a credit picker, so I'm always rooting for a credit picker's market. But it feels very clear to me we're in a credit picker's market right now. Or if you can do a good job picking credit, there's some very good yields to earn. If you're buying the market like everyone else and you have lots of capital to deploy, you're going to find that you're going to have a few hiccups along the way. How do you think of, and you know, people think about Oak Tree, the KKRs of the world, as private credit giants. But the reality yeah. is, is you do a lot in liquid markets, a too. Lot. How do you think about the opportunities, public versus private? I think right now there's, a, there's going to be a lot to do on the public side. You know, liquidity has become a popular thing again. I think, you know, a lot of people put it onto the private credit side because you were getting paid a little extra because you needed that little extra because yields weren't very high. Now that the yields on the public side get higher, that's going to become interesting too. And the thing you got to remember, you know, there's this love affair in the market with private credit because it doesn't mark to market. Everybody loves it. The market's up, the market's down, but my private credit stays flat. What I remind people is if it doesn't mark to market, that means you always have to buy at par. And on the public side, there are periods where you can buy at 80, 90 cents on the dollar. And doing that gives you less downside because you're buying at a discount. And it gives you more upside because if you retrace par before maturity, you're going to earn more than your yield. And so I think there's become really interesting opportunities on both sides of the fence today. How do you feel about how people perceive returns, public versus private? You know, a QR, for example, did a study the other day that said high yield will get you about 3.4 percent, private credit 3.6 percent. It's not that much of a difference. Right. But is that meaning taking on more risk in private and public markets? Sorry. Well, you know, I, I don't think it necessarily has to mean taking on more risk. I think you'll find there, depending on, on the sectors, there's going to be some more risk on the private side and there's going to be some more risk on the public side. But I do think that the returns are going to be different. I think that on the private side, it's going to be all income. And so the reality is when you see, depending on where markets are, you'll see there's a pickup in liquidity going back and forth, whether you're getting paid a liquidity premium. You know, it's funny, I have people say to me from time to time, I don't, it's, I don't need a liquidity premium. It's a small piece of my portfolio. I've got a big portfolio. And I always tease people that it's the wrong question. Whether you need a liquidity premium isn't the question. The question is, are you getting paid to bear the risk of illiquidity? You should get paid for every risk you bear. And I think there are periods where you get paid quite handsomely to go into the private credit markets. And I think there's periods where they converge and, and it's better to look at the public markets. And I think being flexible in these types of environments is going to be the key to, to success. You know, you mentioned some caution a little earlier, the thing, the possibility <laughs> that things could turn. Yeah. What do you avoid in this market? Well, so right now, when I think about the market, to me, it comes down to this concept of the pivot. I think the market is very, very focused on this, this Fed pivot. I think over the last few years, that's probably the most common question I got. I would talk to people about fundamentals, about market technicals. Everyone said, that's fine. I just want to know when the Fed's going to pivot. And I would tease people and say, well, the Fed doesn't know when the Fed's going to pivot. So I, I don't know. But what I did tell people, I said, look, I can't tell you when the Fed's going to pivot or how, but I can tell you why. 
and this is the part that I think is so important when you think about risk in the market, because I feel like the market's totally lost sight as to why. And I tell people the Fed is not in the business of propping up the stock market. As, long, as much as everyone wants that to be true, that's not actually the mandate. The Fed's in the business of propping up the economy. Those aren't always the same thing, which means if you believe we're going to be in a market with over five cuts in this year, then there needs to be some crisis. And if you believe we're in a soft or no landing, there's no reason to have five cuts. You can't have both. But if you believe, as I do, that in this scenario, barring a crisis, rates likely stick around where they are, maybe a little bit lower, but certainly not five cuts lower, that means that companies are going to have to pay this interest for longer. David, quick, quick question here for you, yeah. just in 30 seconds or so here. Most crowded trade that you're most concerned about today? The, what I'm most concerned about is everybody piling into duration very quickly, just hoping that rates are going to drop and, and bail them out. David, thank you so much for your time. Thank that you. is David Rosenberg of Oak Tree. We also want to mention again, the S&P has risen to a new intraday record high, and it is extending those gains in the session. That is despite all of that change around rate expectations. We'll be covering it all for you this afternoon into the close. But first, the week ahead. The Fed's preferred gauge of inflation in the pipeline up next week. And that is next on Bloomberg Real Yield. I'm Shanali Basak, and this is Bloomberg Real Yield. It's time now for the final spread, the week ahead. Coming up we, on Tuesday, we have a Bank of Japan decision, plus Netflix, Netflix kicks off a busy week of earnings, and Wednesday, it's Tesla's turn to report results. Thursday, we get an ECB decision and Christine Lagarde's news conference, along with a key U.S. GDP data point. And Friday, a read on the Fed's preferred gauge of inflation. That is the PCE deflator, and we are going to see, yes, the PCE deflator may be flat. 2.6%, but the core is expected to drop to 3% from 3.2%. Uh, we'll keep an eye on that. Also, month over month changes of 0.2%. And, you know, remember, this is the last big data point that we're going to see before that big Fed decision. A lot riding on what's happening over here. Now, from New York, that does it from us. Tune in next week at a new time, noon Eastern. Going forward, that's where you can find us every Friday. And for now, this was Bloomberg Real Yield, and this is Bloomberg.